Welcome everyone to the third and final recording of our mini series within the series. Today we are here with Bridget Martin to talk about oral history and specifically about how to analyze oral history interviews with our students. This is the third and final part in a three series webinar on oral history, which is part of our bigger webinar series on history outside of the classroom. I'm very, very happy to be here with Bridget. Once again, Bridget is a member of the history and teaching and learning team, a history teacher and a big Eurocleo friend. And as a Eurocleo friend, she has worked on several projects, including a project where she developed a teacher's guide on oral history, which you will find linked below. Bridget, take it away. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Okay, so third and final part, of course, I've skipped quite a few steps, but I've decided to just hone in on some of the most important areas. So for this final part, I want to look at analyzing the oral history interviews. And I think this is really important, particularly because some research has indicated that students, and particularly this is true with real life interviews that they've conducted as opposed to pre-recorded interviews, that students can tend to accept much more readily on face value things that have been shared through these types of sources. And we need to be careful that, of course, we should be very respectful of the stories and, and experiences that are shared with us through oral history interviews. But they are, again, a, a historical source. And we spend a lot of time with students in general, evaluating historical sources, understanding what they can tell us about history, what their strengths might be, some limitations we should be cautious of or aware of. And we need to be making sure that students are doing the same thing with oral history interviews. Now, this could apply to interviews that they have conducted themselves, or this is also something that could be used with pre-recorded interviews that you've accessed on an archive online, for example. So what I'm showing you here, this beautiful diagram, is has come from a research that I conducted with Tim Hauchens and Barbara Henkes. Tim, I hope I didn't butcher your name there, at the University of Honinger. And the research was focused on really looking at what oral historians do and how could we capture those approaches and ways of thinking and bring them into the classroom. So it's a little bit like what we do every day with historical thinking, but focusing particularly on oral history. So what you can see in the center here is that students, of course, need to really understand what oral history is in order to be able to analyze the sources, what its aims are, which are often slightly different to the aims of history more broadly. Particularly oral historians are interested in not only what happened in the past, but also how that past is, was, and is experienced and remembered and so on by different individuals. So it can be slightly different to other portions of sort of mainstream disciplinary history in terms of what we're trying to learn. And also there are certain beliefs and practices that go along with oral history. In the second layer, you can see a number of concepts that students can focus on to sort of direct their analysis of oral history interviews. I would definitely not be suggesting or encouraging you to use all of these every time you're analyzing a source, but these are some of the particular areas that you could or perhaps should if we're really trying to mimic what professional oral historians do, direct students attention to as they're doing that analysis. So I'm going to, as briefly as I can, take you through those so you know what they're about. And then I'll, I'll focus particularly on two of them and some really practical activities you might use to develop students' understandings of those concepts. So I'm going to start with the blue on sort of the top right side of the screen, which for me is subjectivity. Now, we could absolutely suggest that almost every historical source or documentary source is subjective and, and objectivity is very difficult to come by. But I think this is especially true in oral history, where it is a very personal source and, and the interest of oral history is particularly on the individual person's perspectives and memories and experiences. And so thinking about how that influences uh, what we can understand from the source is an important starting point. Another important thing for us to consider is what I've called here orality and embodiment, which essentially means how the person is speaking. So their accent, the volume, the speed with which they're speaking and so on. And also 
their physicality, so their facial expressions and gestures and so on. And this is something really unique to oral history sources. And it can really enhance our understanding of people's experiences and memories and, and aspects of the past. So I'll show you some interesting activities to explore that area in a moment. Moving down to the green, I've got here what I call performance, which may sound a little bit funny, but if you think about it, anytime someone is being interviewed, in some way they are going to be performing and presenting a certain image of themselves. And that would be true if their audience is just their interviewer, and perhaps even more exacerbated if they're being recorded and they know that recording is going to be shared with a broader public, that people naturally want to try to present themselves in a certain way. And that might affect the way they dress, that might affect the type of language they use, that might affect the stories they choose to tell or not to tell, and the way that they explain their own actions and so on. This is very natural and, and certainly students have quite an easy time understanding it because they can imagine how they might act differently if they were being recorded and knew that recording would be shared and so on. But it is important for us to remember this and how that might affect the way someone tells their story. That brings us then, talking of stories, to narrative. And this is another aspect that we, or students can really analyze in terms of what is the flow of the narrative and how have we, I mean, narratives is something that we love as humans, is to take different elements and put them together in a complete story. And it's interesting to see how that plays out as a person is telling their story in an oral history interview. So how have they perhaps used elements of narrative like heroes and villains or a particular genre or there's a complication and a resolution in the narrative and so on. But we might also here be talking about how an individual person's narrative either aligns or does not align with other narratives that the students might have encountered around this historical event or topic. And this can be a really interesting place for them to think about you know, what this interview might be able to tell us about this period of history. Presentation is probably less relevant for students conducting their own interviews and more about if students are looking at online interviews, for example, how is the way it's presented perhaps affecting the interview? So this might be looking for editing, for example, looking to see, can we actually hear the questions that's being asked by the interviewer or are we only hearing the responses? And does that change the way that we understand what the person is saying? And that's, of course, very closely connected to the next point along, which is the role of the interviewer. Now, hopefully, if students have done a lot of work that we looked at in the last video around themselves as the interviewer and how that can impact the interview, they've already got lots of ideas about how they as the interviewer may be changed or affected the way that that discussion unfolded. It's also interesting here to think about the relationship that the student as the interviewer has with the person they're interviewing. So say a student's interviewing their grandmother, for example, they might want to think about, well, are there certain things that your grandmother maybe wouldn't want to share with you because you're her grandchild or similarly or perhaps conversely other things that perhaps your grandmother can share with you because she knows you'll understand them because you come from the same family and the same background so these kinds of things are also interesting for students to think about and how that might affect the stories that were told and how they were told and so on as we keep moving along, we then have memory work, which I'm going to develop in a bit more detail later, so I won't talk about it too much here, but it's around how our memories evolve over time and what that means for the sources that we're using. And also, this is closely related to forgetting and silence. So are there things that people either can't or choose not to remember and speak about? And what can that tell us about the past as well? And you can see then in the final circle, right around the outside, there's accuracy and generalizability, which I've separated because I think accuracy is really talking about specific factual details. Are there things in these interviews that are accurate factually or not? And what does that mean for us as interviewers or as historians? Does it mean that we dismiss the whole source? Well, hopefully the answer is no, but what does it mean about how we can understand the past? Generalizability 
I think is more to do less with the factual elements, but perhaps more to do with those, the feelings and the emotions and the experiences that people had. And as we're interviewing this one person, do we get a sense based on our other research or based on other interviews that their experience was something that was shared, was generalizable, or was it something just very specific to them? And how does that affect what this particular interview tells us about the past? So that's essentially the key parts of the framework. As I said, I'm just going to go into depth with two of those elements for today. But if you'd like to read more about it, I've got the details of the article a little bit further at the end of the presentation. All right, so practical ideas. Here we go. Orality and embodiment in interviews. So unlike other texts and sources, oral sources are letting us see and hear the narrator. And so what we're looking for here are things that I mentioned earlier the volume with which the narrator speaks, the speed, the intonation, and so on. And of course, these give us clues about how they feel about the things they're speaking about. Perhaps they slow down or speak more loudly to emphasize certain points. Perhaps they speed up to skip over things that they don't particularly want to talk about, all kinds of things that we could learn from that. And then going along with that is, of course, the physicality. So how does gesture and posture allow people to express ideas that perhaps are inexpressible in words. So I remember reading a while ago about an oral historian who was doing some study in Indonesia. And I, I forget the details, but I do recall that the person they were interviewing was an elderly man and he was talking about losing some members of his family. And the oral historians described how at one point in the interview, he just stopped speaking entirely and took one finger and just pulled it down the side of his cheek. And that's something that we just cannot capture in words or in language. And, and that he obviously felt that he couldn't capture with words and, and needed to demonstrate otherwise. And so we can look at how we can learn things about people's experiences in other ways, not just using their words. So a few strategies that you might use to do that. These are kind of opposites of the same idea. One is you might play a small part of an interview, but turn the sound off and just have the students watch the video and then ask them what do they think it might, will be about, how does the interviewee seem to feel, these kinds of questions, and then play it back with the sound and see what the students were actually able to understand already without the sound off and how the words worked together with that, those other aspects of physicality and so on to create a particular meaning and a particular understanding. The opposite here, is to instead show students a transcript of a particular interview or piece of an interview. And this works best if you can choose something that where there is a bit of a disconnect between what's written in the words and how it's expressed by the person and see if they can anticipate how the interviewee seems to feel about a topic and then look at the video to compare. So one way that I do this is with this Example here, so I ask students, how do you think this woman feels about this story? And I give them this piece of the transcript of the interview. Now, I won't read it aloud because the point is for you to take in what the words might mean on their own. So if you'd like to practice this exercise yourself, you might want to just pause the video now and have a read and then press play when you're ready. Now, this is actually a section of the interview that was taken of a woman called Betty Zoltan. You can see the details at the bottom of the slide here. If you type that into Google, you'll find it very easily. And if you look at 38, 35, you'll see her tell this story while laughing, which is not something that students typically anticipate because what's mentioned in the story are some quite difficult experiences that her husband, I believe, is going through. Now, then, of course, we can have lots of discussions about why she might be laughing while telling the story and whether that's a coping mechanism or whether it, she's genuinely amused, amused because it was so long ago and she has a distance from it or whatever that might be. But the, the key is to try and choose something where the words don't necessarily correspond to how the person is saying whatever they're saying and then investigating, well, how does listening to and looking at the person help us get a different understanding of their feelings and their experience rather than just using their words alone. So some general guiding questions that you might give to students 
as they're then going off to analyze their own interviews or things like this. What do you notice about the way the narrator speaks, how they move? Does this change throughout the interview and why might this happen? And then what can we learn about their story by looking at these aspects? So this can help the students to then unpack these elements of the, their own interviews. So the second area I wanna have a look at in a little bit more depth is memory work. This is hugely complex. And of course, students aren't gonna be able to engage with some of the more complex aspects of memory work. And indeed, I find some of it challenging because it's very complex. <laughs> I think I've overused the word, but it, it is a very difficult area that, that psychologists are continuing to work with. But there are certain things that we can make sure that students are conscious of as we're working with memory. Remembering that oral history is also interested in how we remember things that happened in the past. So the interest of the study is not only on the, the truth of what happened, lots of inverted commas, but also on how that is remembered. So some things they might think about, what's been remembered and why? How does an individual's memory perhaps interact with collective memory of this issue and uh, you might see signs even of, of the interviewee talking about collective memory and shared memory and and how this is remembered with other parts of the community and how might that shared memory Im impact how the individual remembers those events really important is the context at the time of retelling so this can incorporate lots of different aspects like events that have occurred in the intervening years. So another, I'll go back to the example of the researchers in Indonesia who found when they were trying to ask questions to understand the impact of Dutch colonial rule in Indonesia, a lot of the people that they interviewed drew comparisons with the later Japanese occupation in Indonesia. And that later occupation had very much shaped how they then remembered their earlier experience and briefly the later experience under the Dutch and so I think we can look at this we could say this event in conflict for example who the victor is in the conflict and so on might determine the way it is remembered uh, we could also look at how current affairs might shape the way that people look back on particular parts of their lives and changing social values absolutely this is a really important one because people might now feel uncomfortable or ashamed about things that they did or said or felt in the past because society's values have changed over time. And so we might have to look at, at how that affects the way they tell their stories. And last, but I suppose not least, is the fallibility of memory. Our memories aren't perfect. And we need to have discussions about what that means about how useful memory-based sources are. And I think it's important to underscore that, that just because memories are not perfectly accurate doesn't mean they're not helpful for us and our, our understanding, but it is important to acknowledge those issues. So I'm going to look at two strategies with you here to explore some of these ideas. The first is using an age appropriate example of something that students might have experienced that could affect their way of remembering. And the second is to watch some example interviews that demonstrate factual inaccuracies or inconsistencies and then have a discussion about what the implications of that might be. So here's again. Sorry, I've clearly taken lots of examples from grade seven. So we're talking 12 year old students here. So here was a scenario that I gave them, for instance. Let's imagine that you're asking someone to tell you about, to describe, let's say, their best friend from a year ago. And I asked them, the students, well, do you think that their answer would be different if they were still friends with that person versus if they'd had a really big fight with that person, they didn't speak to them anymore? Now this might seem quite facile and essentially it is, but it's something that the students really can relate to, especially at 12, 13 years old, there's a lot of friendship dramas going on. And they, it does promote really interesting discussions about well, how the way we think about something and remember something might change depending on what's happened in the time since. And from there, you can then make those links and extrapolate to how this might affect the way the people they interview remember the things that they've experienced in the past and, and why that might change over time. So that's a very quick example. This one comes from an online collection that I highly recommend if you teach civil rights at all. 
It's actually a series of interviews that were conducted for the Eyes on the Prize documentary, but they've made available online the complete interviews, unedited, so you're able to watch them in their very pure form. And that in itself can be quite interesting to then compare the full interviews with the small clips that were edited into the documentary, for example. But in this particular case, I chose two interviews with the same woman called Georgia Gilmore. And one of the interviews was conducted in 79 and one was in 86. And you can see the timestamps are there. So I'm sure you can look up these interviews yourselves if you did want to use this. But essentially I asked the students particularly to listen out for, she talks about a fundraising club that was raising money to support the Montgomery bus boy. And if you ask students to listen out for the club, which part of town the club represented, and also how much money they raised each week, of course, I'm asking these questions because she's inconsistent on these two points. She gives different facts in each of the interviews. So once you've had the students have a look out for those and identify these inconsistencies, then there are some questions that you might discuss with them. So why might these facts be different in the different interviews? They're taken seven years apart, for example. To what extent does that change our understanding of the community efforts to support the boycott? So if that's, let's say, our research question or our inquiry questions, how did the community support the boycott? Does the fact that those details are inconsistent change our understanding? And how much? Does it mean that we should doubt all parts of Gilmore's testimony if those details changed between the two interviews? And how might we try and find the facts? How can we check where the club really did belong to and how much was raised each week? And that is not always an easy question to answer. So this might guide the discussion a little bit for those kinds of topics, but I think it's interesting and important for students to look at the fact that memory is, is fallible and how can we deal with that as we're trying to use oral histories to understand the past. So once again, I've put together just a list of key guiding questions that the students might then use for their own interviews or when analysing another interview. So what's the narrator remembered and why? Is there something they're unable to remember and why might that be? Can dis consistencies or inaccuracies and does it matter? How might the narrator's memories have shaped, been shaped by collective memories of events? And to have a think about the impact of context and how that might affect the way the narrator remembers. So those are just two quick examples and I'd like to pause and thank you very much but also give you a little bit of further reading as well. So these are the sources that I used predominantly to prepare this presentation. Now that first article there is the one that will give you a bit more detail about that particular framework and the other elements if you'd be interested in reading more about it. There is the guide that's published by Euroclio on their website and Donald Ritchie, whose definition we used in the first video. And I also have here for you some suggested readings. So the ones at the top are more sort of in-depth theoretical texts if you're really, if you've been intrigued enough by oral history that you want to read some more. And the ones down the bottom are more practical guides for using oral history in the classroom. I very strongly recommend them. They're both hugely useful. So they might also be a good point to go in a little bit more further depth if you want to use oral history in your classroom. And that is it from me. Thank you, Bridget, very, very much for hosting, well, today's session and for hosting the other two sessions that we have recorded earlier. It was great. I hope participants will now start doing a little bit of oral history projects with their classrooms. This is exactly the reason why we are recording these sessions now and hosting the webinar series on history outside of the classroom at least partially before the beginning of the school year. We hope this will give you some time to plan when to do this and how to do this with your students in the next school year. You will find our contact details in the description to, of today's video. So please do reach out if you have any questions or comments or if you would like to host another recording with us. And yeah, Bridget, thank you so, so much and see you soon.